just fired up. So I wore my T-shirt today, and I thought it was cool, you know, like God said, you to the end, you square word of this, blah, 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 and then there was light. But nobody, nobody likes it as much as I do. The thing that I like is that what is so complicated to us is just a word from God, that he spoke everything into existence. That blows my mind. So that's why I wore the shirt, which I usually don't do. All right, let's get this rocking and rolling. So I had a hard time uh, putting this together, and I was traveling this week. I went to uh, Savannah, Georgia, just before the hurricane. And I was listening to a book by Rick Warren, and it gave me some thoughts and ideas of what I would talk about. And I always piece together different thoughts and ideas, and it always seems to come together. So with a little help from God's Holy Spirit today, I hope, uh, I know God will be with me and we'll put this together. So let's start off with a prayer. Lord, you are our dwelling place. I give thanks for the blessings of my church family. And I love that we gather together to worship you and mutually encourage one another. I thank you that we have the privilege of praying together and, and praying for each other. I thank you for the fellowship we have while eating, working, and serving together. And we are blessed by, by our brothers and sisters in Christ and how our individual gifts and personalities blend into a precious whole. So I pray today that your word comes forth to move us toward you closer in relationship and keep us on a path that delivers us all to eternity in heaven with you through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So what I was thinking of, and I had to tie it into my own life experience, and uh, repeatedly the last few um, sermons, the same scripture came up from the pastor, from Pastor Roy, and I had had this one written down for a while, and it was Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And while I was listening to Rick Warren, it dawned on me that I've always thought of this scripture in terms of this life in this world. But God's perspective is so much broader, and it hit me that God's not only talking about this world, but he's talking about the world to come. His plans include us with him in heaven. How can you go wrong, right? How can you go wrong? And how I was always so limited in my thinking to think that it was only talking about this little finite world that we happen to live in today. And I think once you get that picture that we're only here for a, a flash of vapor, it changes everything, everything that we do. So I began to piece together um, what I'm going to talk about today based upon that. You know, we don't think of God in those terms, and his thoughts are so much bigger and beyond ours that uh, we, we find out that as we go through journeys looking toward God, we don't realize he's there until we look back upon what he did for us. And then we say, all along, he's been there. He's been with us the whole time. So we talk about dreams, and that was what uh, Rick Warren was talking about in his book. So there's a connection between our dreams and becoming the kind of person that God wants us to be. You know, we, we have a dream in this world, and it's uh, earthly. It's finite. It's about what we want, and it's not on the path that God wanted for us. Uh, so life has a way of taking its own direction, and it doesn't necessarily come out the way we intended, certainly not the way God wants, but it has a way of redirecting us back to the path that he wants us to be on. So that's where I kind of thought about what happened to me in my life and how I got redirected along the way. So one of the things we find that we have a gift of imagination. Our imagination is what separates us from other creatures on earth that God created. You know, uh, we look at birds and they're made to fly, and yet we're not made to fly, but because we wanted to, we figured out how to do it, and now we fly. We look at the ocean and the fish in the ocean, and uh, we say, well, wouldn't it be cool to swim underwater and spend some time down there? And then we figure out with our imagination how we're going to do it, and all of a sudden, we're able to do it. Only God's one creation, mankind, in which he was very 
He said, uh, not only was, was it was good, it was very good when he made us. And that was part of the original plan, is that we would be like God in imagination and creativity as well. So there we find uh, that aspect of how we were made by God. The one thing we find is that the dreams we have, they shape our identity, they affect our happiness in this world, and our total fulfillment, whether we achieve them or not. And again, I said we have earthly dreams, and then we have God-inspired dreams. So we find God-inspired dreams have eternal implications and eternal benefits, right? Everything starts with a dream. God said in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created. He spoke. Like I said, he spoke light into existence. He spoke everything into existence. And when we look at the complexity of some of the creatures on the earth and how they come together in an amazing interwoven support system to support life on the planet, it's mind-boggling. It really is. Only God could do something like that. You know, and to think that something like that just randomly happened makes me laugh that people actually believe that. So one thing about dreamers, the Bible's full of adult dreamers. We can take a look at uh, uh, Noah, for example. Noah was given a godly dream to build an ark. And we're looking at something that took, what, over 100 years for him to put it together. And what was totally amazing about that whole story is that it has never rained on earth at that time. The, it says in the Bible that the water came up from the ground to water the crops, right? So all of a sudden, we're spending 100 years building an ark to save humanity because the thoughts of men were continuously evil. And God spoke to Noah. And God's going to speak to you. You've got to be in a position to hear him. You've got to have that ability. You've got to be doing something right in approaching God, knowing that he's real, having faith that he exists, where you're in communication with God. So we find dreamers like Noah. Moses had a dream to, uh, to basically take the enslaved uh, uh, Jewish people out, out of slavery from Egypt. You know? And yet we find complications along the way. The, the, I heard that the, the walking trip to the promised land from Egypt is actually about a two weeks walk. But yet they spent 40 years going in circles in the desert because of delays and complications that we find that they had, mostly that were brought on by themselves and their, probably their lack of faith, right, and trusting God. So one of the things we find, without any kind of faith, it's impossible to please God. And anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So this faith thing is the key. And then we say, well, gee, it's, it's so hard sometimes where I'm so caught up in the world to talk to a God that I can't see or touch, but he's there. We find that we matter to God. He desires wonderful things for us, as he says, for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, and plans to give you hope in the future. God gets what he wants, because he's the creator of everything, but there's one thing that prevents him from getting everything that he wants, and that's our free will, because we have say in what happens. And that's the only thing that blocks us to a life with eternity for God is our free will and the choices that we make. One thing we find when we turn to God in faith, he comes into our lives, and no matter what we have done, no matter how much we've messed up, he can restore us to a place beyond our imagination. Now, I talk about the term restoration, but God is truly beyond restoration, not restoring us to what we were, but transforming us into what he wants us to become, and into the image of Jesus Christ, his son. So that's an interesting process. When Change is tough for a lot of people. Transformation is a tough process. It isn't easy. It can be painful, especially in this world. Some of the best lessons I've ever learned really, really hurt. When I got done, I said, I'm glad that's done. I don't want to go back there, but I sure learned a lot from it. And now I'm a different person because of it, right? So God knows that. Uh, we can look at the life of the apostles. And one of the things we find is that they had activated faith. They had the, the blessings of the Holy Spirit to work with them. But what all the trials and tribulations that each of them went through, especially I want to focus on the Apostle Paul. 
but there was a process in place where after they got done with one trial and tribulation, they were strengthened. They were stronger than they were before. And it was because of the ordeal that they go through, the process that they go through, that the transformation takes place. You know, when you think of the birthing process, you know, we're in our mother's womb, it's warm and fuzzy and it's comfortable and I'm getting fed. I don't even have to open my mouth to eat. It comes through a tube, right? And then I'm being formed and developed in a womb. And then all of a sudden, one day, bright light hits me, it's cold, and somebody smacks me on the backside. <laughs> Within a few minutes of birth into the next world, it's painful, it's uncomfortable. But now, I'm in a new stage of development. I'm in a world that God created, and then we say, well, we're all gonna die someday. What if the world we're living in now is just a new, another formation, another chance to develop, another chance to move on and develop into what God wants us to be? But it's more complicated than the birth from the womb. When we pass away, I think we're gonna wake up, and I'm not sure, what to expect on the other side, but it's going to be another rebirth. Birth into the eternal kingdom of God, right? In relationship with our creator. Not a bad place to be for eternity. So when you believe that in that context, everything that happens here is important as long as we're focused correctly and we recognize that this is just a temporary world that we live in, right? As we say, we come into this world with nothing other than our body and our spirit. And again, we leave the world with our spirit, our, our developed character, again, just spirit and character, right? The Bible's blunt. We come in with nothing and we leave with nothing. We don't take anything with us. We look at 1 Timothy 6, 7, right? 1 Timothy 6, 7. It says, uh, we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. So we look at our dreams in this world and we focus on what we, we make a priority, right? What we, we make uh, an objective. And we find that, um, is it earthly? Is it selfish? Is it fleshly? Or is that dream and objective God inspired? Is it coming from the right source? Will we find that somebody else in this world will impose their dream on us? Maybe godly, maybe it won't. When we pursue our dreams, if we're not in line with what God wants us to do, he may not bless what we're doing. And some of our dreams, is some of us have experienced the things we pursue, not, not the dreams at night, but the dreams that we pursue as objectives can actually turn into nightmares. So the growth process we find begins with dreaming in this world. And when God gives us a dream, we've got to have faith. And he uses this process of faith to even build our faith even further when we go through and pursue a dream that God gives us. The dreaming is the catalyst for personal change. His desire is to prepare us for a life with eternity in heaven with him. That's what it's all about. So while we focus on building our dreams on earth, God's interest is for building our character for life in heaven, right? To so think about that. What, what happens that builds your character, that changes who you are? The fabric of your character comes from godly dreams and the pursuit of godly dreams. So the development here is a lifelong process and his dream is unfolded through time. And one of the things you find in dealing with God is that it takes patience. We're so, I get upset if I have to wait in line at McDonald's. I'm stuck in traffic, I get a little irritated. You know, instant gratification is the world in which we live in. And we find when we're dealing with God and the objective that God is dealing to mold us, to shape us, it unfolds not necessarily instantaneously. Years, it takes a long time. So we gotta have patience in the process. We gotta recognize that God is there. And it requires that level of patience uh, to, to go along with God's plan for our life. Remember, he says he has plans for us to prosper us, and that's what he is after. So he takes us in a, we go in a direction given to us by God. It takes faith, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
God's dream is unfolded slowly. As dreams unfold, it becomes clearer and clearer. Let's go to scripture, Matthew 7, 7. This is kind of an interesting one. It says, ask and keep asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who keeps on asking receives, and he who keeps on seeking finds. And to him who keeps on knocking, it will be opened. You notice the emphasis on keep, persistency, nonstop trying. So when you seek God, it's not an instantaneous process to find him and hear from him. So the word keep requires patience and persistence. Even in some of our own earthly dreams, right? To achieve our earthly dreams takes patience and persistence. You know, we don't have a lot of control of a lot of things in this world. We didn't pick our parents. We didn't pick the financial level that we'd be born in. We didn't pick the country we'd be born in. So a lot of things are out of our control. But we do choose one thing. The one thing we do choose in this world as we get presented with this choice on whether we accept God's invitation to pursue his dream for our lives. So it requires seeking God, pursuing the dream he has for us, and I think we get born again, we go to church, most of us, and for a long time, myself included, we sit on the pew, but we never seek further what God's plan is for us beyond sitting on that pew and going to church on Sunday. Um, I'm guilty. So we gotta, we got to seek God continuously. We have to have communication with God to make that happen. To say, God, what do you want from me? And we have to have the ability to hear him talk back to us. You know, I pursue the worldly dream. Uh, it took persistence in my worldly dream. You know, I was a young guy in high school, 18 years old. I had really good grades. Uh, I applied for military academies, the Air Force Academy, the Coast Guard Academy. I got accepted at both. I went to the Coast Guard Academy. They had something like over 10,000 applicants. They took 420. Of the 420 that went into my class, only 202 graduated. It was hard. I had so many all-nighters, and I had a dream that when I got out, it would be a worthy cause, it would be a noble cause, it would be an interesting and exciting life. But it was my dream, it was earthly. Uh, I had walked away from the Catholic Church many, many years before. I hadn't been pursuing God, I was kind of running away from God. So I got out, I was on two different Coast Guard cutters, uh, busting guys for drugs. It was exciting, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I learned a lot. I could shoot stars at night and navigate by the stars. I could uh, go down in the engine room and run all the engines and make fresh water out of salt water and I could do all these different things. And then they sent me uh, to a Lorraine station on the north end of Okinawa for 18 months isolated duty. And I was in charge at the age of 25, 32 guys. And we did top secret stuff. In addition to sending out a navigation signal for thousands of miles that uh, the Coast Guard ran all the navigation stations back in the 1970s. They didn't have satellite navigation back then. As they came around 1985, we, we, we switched from Lorraine into satellite. So we were it as far as any type of electronic navigation. So here I am, I come off of that. I get assigned to Portland, Maine, and I'm a single guy. Got a lot of money, been saving it. Bought a house on Sebago Lake, right? Bachelor pad, it was really cool. Beautiful, right on the water, had a guest cottage, had a, a, a boat that I could lower into the water on railroad tracks and a cradle, had a boathouse. I, I was doing pretty good. And I was getting ready to go to grad school for my master's degree for the Coast Guard. And they sent me to a college in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, Lithicum Heights. I remember I was there for like three months and I had been going to a diner every day and I met the waitress, had a little boy who was like three or four months old. Well, when I got back to the Maine, she showed up on my doorstep with the little boy. Uh, we got married, I adopted him as my son, had a little girl. And then in 18 months, everything I had worked for was gone. Uh, my career was totally changed. My wife was gone. I had two little kids. I was in financial trouble. So all of a sudden, it was like I had great plans, but they weren't godly plans. And everything fell apart. 
So as a last ditch effort to save the marriage, her foster parents lived in Tennessee, so I took a tour of duty in Nashville. And it fell apart as soon as, as we got here in Nashville. And there I was, destitute, um, with two little kids. Uh, finances were terrible. Uh, and I'm not, I don't wanna, I, I'm just gonna just say, we were unevenly yoked. And I wish the very best for, for her today. But needless to say, at that point in my life, my neighbor turned out to be a top executive at Thomas Nelson Publishing. They have the biggest producer of Bibles in the world, right? Invited me over for dinner. For the first time, he told me about Jesus Christ, the part that the Catholic Church, I didn't, get, I didn't stay in long enough to hear it. And uh, I was amazed. You know, led me through the sinner's prayer, linked me up with a mentor who, first time I ever heard anybody pre, pre, uh, talk in tongues, scared the daylights out of me. I remember what he said, it was like Valencia, Valencia, and I'm thinking, why is he talking about orange juice? <laughs> then I looked it up later, and Valencia actually means power. Well, so I, I just kind of, all these years I finally figured, why don't you look it up and see what it really means? But I got born again, okay? So all of a sudden things were changing. After, soon after I said the sinner's prayer, I was living in an apartment in Hermitage that, uh, my ex had demanded that we purchase it was way beyond our means. Uh, I, I, they let me out of the lease. I got a place comfortable that I could live in and I met another Christian man that rented me a house in Hendersonville for peanuts. He looked at me and he looked at the kids and he says, oh man, you need all the help you can get. And he, we didn't sign a lease, he shook my hand and uh, he said, hey, uh, that's good enough for me and I moved in. And at that point, I had two little kids. Uh, I got rid of an expensive car, and I got a Volkswagen Rabbit with a diesel engine, best car I ever had in my life. 50 miles to a gallon of diesel when diesel was cheap back then. I could drive from here to Washington, D.C. on one tank of gas. It was great. But anyway, uh, I, I started going to church, uh, the Baptist Church in Hendersonville. I went to Bible study. I had my kids in Bible study. And then the next stroke of God hit me. I met this hot little blonde at a fitness center I was working at. And she would wait on me while I would drink beer. And we got to know each other over a couple years. And that was, that was like 40 years ago that I first met Charlotte. And we were dated going to church together. And all of a sudden, everything changed. Everything changed. I got out of active duty service after 12 years and I went into the reserves and I didn't know what I was gonna do. I'm sitting around the house looking at a newspaper, actually in the Coast Guard office, I was still on active duty. And they had an advertisement for a safety engineer and I'm reading the bullets and it's like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. I can do that too. So I wrote a resume, first one I ever wrote, sent it out and they called me on the phone and I got interviewed and I didn't think I did that hot on the interview. And Charlotte heard me saying, well, that's the end of that job. And she started laughing. She said, are you kidding me? She said, you nailed it. And then sure enough, the next day I got called to fly up to Chicago. And they interviewed me again up in Chicago and I got the job. And that started everything rolling. I had two months leave where I was getting paid by the Coast Guard. Immediately went to work from then. And my finances like totally flipped around all at one point in time. Got a severance pay, we bought a home. And then instantly I went from a dream of my own to a dream where God was now the center of what was going on with me. And everything flipped around. So we talk about pursuing dreams and the biggest question I think we have to ask, and I ask myself this, all right, so you got an objective, it's a dream you have today, is it from God or is it you? Is it earthly? And I ask myself that question a lot because I've learned from that experience that it makes all the difference in the world. So it takes faith and it takes patience to move forward with God. So the question that comes up on faith, is the faith that we have strong or weak? Is it steady or is it stretched? Jesus said everything is possible if you have faith. Your faith affects how much God blesses your life on earth, right? In Romans 12, three, it says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. 
So once we get born again, we have some semblance of faith. We wouldn't have said the prayer if we didn't want to believe. The faith is there. The mustard seed of faith is there. But how do you make it grow? So that's when I'm reading uh, Rick Warren. You know, I'm listening to audiobooks on the plane flying out to Savannah. And he, he's an interesting guy. He wrote the book, um, The Purpose Driven Life, right? And now he's talking from his observations in dealing with people and having experienced a lot of different things in which God is the focal point in the center. He found that God predictably takes us through six phases of faith. And I started going through the phases, and it made me go back to what I went through just in getting born again, and it tied in with a lot of that. The first one is we dream. We have an objective, and the dream is, is it mine or is it God's? So if that dream is God's, the next thing is we have to make a decision to move on it. Some of us have dreams, come from God, but we never take action on it. We continue to just sit on the back pew. You know, maybe that dream is to take uh, enslaved people out of a country and rescue them, them and bring them to Jesus. Or maybe the dream is just walk across the street and meet your new neighbor. Let them know that you're there. Let them know what your faith is. You know, so we make that decision to take action on what God tells us to do. Then there's a delay and there's difficulties. So, you know, we look at Moses in the desert. They had a 40-year delay. They had difficulties right? We look at the Apostle Paul. He had a dream to go to Rome. Well, what happened to him when he started it out, right? God tells him he's going to go on a ship and it's going to wreck. Every, everybody's going to live. But there's a delay and then there's troubles and there's difficulties. So what happens in the trouble and the difficulty is that when we go through this process, those troubles and difficulties are building our faith. Because when we come out the back end of that, and we look what God has done to pull us out of that mess, it's like, wow, God was there the whole time. It's incredible. I look at some of the things that happened in meeting Charlotte and our relationship and how everything had come together. I couldn't have put it together so perfectly. It was a miracle. It was literally God's hand involved in the, not only a restoration for me personally, but beginning of a transformation for me to move closer to God and to seek God with more zeal. Right. So Rick Warren says, after the delay and the difficulties, we come to a dead end. It's like, I've done everything in my power to get out of this situation or make it better, and I can't do anything. But remember, this is a God dream. You're pursuing it. God's there with you. And in spite of all the difficulties, at the end, there's a deliverance. A deliverance that takes place that only God could pull off. And so when you get through this whole process... When you look back at what God did and what he achieved, what does it do to your faith? It amplifies that faith. So the only way our faith grows is to go through this, unfortunately, painful process of pursuing God's dream, having delays, difficulties, and troubles, letting that faith grow after we see God come in and do the final rescue work. Because only God could do Some of you here, out here have incredible stories of how God's worked in your lives. You know, they say, one of the, what's the best thing you can do when you meet somebody new? Tell them your testimony. Tell them what God has done for you, right? So anyway, once I was saved, I began moving forward under God's direction. And, uh, you know, uh, part of the, the big thing is, uh, let, me, let me jump ahead. I got ahead of myself here. Yeah, we're building our faith in God. We're looking to fulfill God's plan for our lives. Because a lot of times, God knows what he's doing. And a lot of times, the purpose of the journey we're on to accomplish something for God is probably more to develop our character and our faith in God than to actually get the job done because God really doesn't need any help to get anything done. Do you ever notice that when he's ever moved in the Old Testament, he works through people? He works through his people to listen to him, right? He, he could, you know, I guess you could say with Elijah, fire coming down from heaven, he was still working through Elijah. Elijah, with faith, called fire. If you're standing up in front of, uh, I don't know, four or 500 people that want to kill you, and you're challenging them to a duel of faith at an altar, and you call fire down from heaven, 
it takes a lot of faith to put yourself out there with confidence to know that God's going to answer that. God it responds to that level of faith. So it makes me think and ask questions that I'll pose to you where you can just think about this. When we talk about the phases of faith, what, what phase of faith building are you in right now? You know, have you made, you made the decision, you're all here, you're all born again. Uh, are we seeking God to find out the next step that God wants to take in our lives? What he wants us to do as a dream. Have we done that? So do we have a God dream, but are we comfortable and don't want to take the next step? In other words, we don't want to decide to take action. Do we have a dream, we've made a decision, and we're being delayed with problems because God is working on us, and we have the delay and, and, and the problems in, in pursuit of a dream, and your faith and your he's character or in preparation for your entry into eternity with him. Is that where we're at? We're pursuing it and we're having the troubles and the difficulties and then the question comes up, do I have enough faith to hang in there with God or do I drop the dream and walk away from it? One thing we find in the Bible, John 1 verses 12 to 13, it says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So when you really get it, which I've, I think I, I, I've begun to really get it, everything's never the same again. Everything's different. That we're going to seek God's dream for us, seek God's plan for us, take the action, go through the delay, the trials, and the tribulation, let him form our character so that we become what he wants, which is a transformation into the image of Jesus Christ, Right? That's, that's what we're after. So God's dream for you will require faith. Mustard seed will require you to step out. And one thing we find, it will never involve anything that contradicts his word. So if we're pursuing a dream and we think it's God, if he begins to contradict the word of God, we got a problem. We're going in the wrong direction, right? So God often communicates in a still, small voice. And if we're going to hear God communicate, we've got to make time to listen to him. You may not be hearing from God because you've never been quiet. Right? You've got to be quiet. Even when we look in the Bible, we see Moses going off to spend quiet time away from everything we've got. Right? And we can find the same thing with Abraham, with Joseph, with Jesus. Jesus took time to separate himself and go speak to God the Father. So here is that I ask him myself, I'm guilty. I need to take more quiet time to spend with God so I can hear that still small voice and I can get my next assignment from him. Amen. Right? That's what has to happen. So how many of us are, are actually doing it? You got to realize... Um, there's nothing more important than to recognize and identify and move ahead with God's plan for us. It's eternity we're talking about. It's forever, right? Not only us, but the ones we love, our closest ones. So we want to have an effect and an influence on them. Well, the devil knows that. The devil, devil knows that. He's created a world around us that's so noisy, so many distractions. He just says, well, I, I'll just keep them distracted. I told a story when I was at the academy. We had a Coach Nitchman, and I, I, I just, it frustrates me even to think of it today. The guy's like 67 years old, and we'd have different, uh, we had every sport you can imagine in PE. You know, we had high diving. We had five different levels of rescue swimming. We had golf, and I had tennis. So I got this 65-year-old guy standing in the middle of the court. I'm on the other side, and I said, this isn't any fun. I don't think he can move. So he serves the ball on the end. I run and make this incredible rescue. Where does the ball go? Right back to him in the middle. Where does he hit the ball? He hits it on the other side. He's got me running back and forth, and there's nothing I can do. What do you think the devil does? He laughs. He's been around a long time, just like Coach Nitch, right? He knows what he's doing. He's playing us for a bunch of jokers, right? But he's been defeated. The keys have been taken from him. 
So we don't have to play his game anymore. So he leads us to think that we have all the time in the world to make changes. And yeah, you know, I'll, I'll go into my prayer closet tomorrow. I'll make a little more time and I'll change. But then something comes up and we're distracted again and we don't do it. So we gotta, we gotta muster enough discipline to pull ourselves together. Something's, God can't do it all. He gives us the mustard seed of faith, but there's gotta be enough chutzpah, I guess that's a Jewish term, I heard it on TV, to go off and, and, and get time alone with God, to be able to hear from God. That's a big part of the battle. One thing Paul said in Acts 20, 24, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus Christ has given me, the task of testifying the good news of God's grace. So the mission is pretty straightforward. And one of the things we find to get close to God and find out what God will do with my life, you know, the question to ask is, if I give all of me to God, I give everything to him completely, what would he have me do? And I think we just answered it in that scripture, is to go out and preach the gospel and tell everybody the good news, right? All right, let's end with a prayer. So God, you are the path to everlasting life, and I pray that your Holy Spirit guide us all so that we get on the path to righteousness, direct us in our thoughts and actions so we stay on the narrow path and don't begin to wander. Help us to resist the temptation to follow the crowd down a path that ultimately leads to destruction. Amen. Amen. So, I've got some work to do. You know, it's, you always say we're work in progress. So, I like to think that I can be a little bit better tomorrow than I am today. You know, I always say you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? So... Uh, if, if anything, self-examination is so absolutely important and critical is that we take that step to look at where am I in my relationship with God and what he wants me to do. So if anybody I know has any, uh, wants prayer, uh, we've got Pastor Roy, we've got the pastor, Steve will come and, and pray, and you're always invited to come up here and do that. So with that being said, may God bless you, keep you, may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. And be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you peace. Amen. How many of you uh, could relate to some of that right there? I'll tell you what, I could relate to all of that. Amen. We think we got it kind of going on pretty good and everything's running smooth and then a trial comes our way and that really tests our faith and it really reveals where you're at, where you stand. So it is a work in process. Amen. But uh, one thing Brother Paul said that is so true, we are in such a fast-paced world and such busyness. I always got to do something. Something's going on that we don't have that quiet time with God. And sometimes that quiet time, I've noticed that a lot of times, a lot of you could probably relate to this if you've been in serving the Lord for a while. Uh, a lot of